Yeah, so th this is the unenviable position of being between you and lunch. So, uh, and we will, so we will try not to. Um, all right, so we had, we really had two goals for um, this session here, and, and it may be that we get to one and, and not the other, but our, our, uh, our first goal was to sort of sit back as we're concluding a morning of presentations and discussion and see if we could extract a couple of themes and maybe identify a few things that we can walk away from uh, this morning with that will sort of be a, maybe questions in our minds, common themes that we're observing across these sessions that we can uh, take back with us as we're, as we're thinking about these issues. And the second was, and we may not have as much time for that, so I'm, I'll tell you what, we'll braise a second if we have time for that. So, um, so uh, we, we were sort of thinking we might kind of go through some of these sessions and identify a few of the themes that, that have jumped out. And I want to mention one that I've seen across a couple of presentations and then invite uh, C2 to, to do the same. One of the things that struck me as I've been listening to every one of these presentations is that something that nobody really it was explicit about but that there was somebody, in every one of these cases, there was somebody who stepped forward and said, we got to do this, and there was a will of not only an individual, but of an organization to back that initiative. So if you think about this, you have, and one of the, I thought one of the greatest examples of that was this, um, was the Doherty presentation, where we had people who were willing to step forward on their own volunteer time and identify a need and step into that into that vacuum and say, okay, what can we do? And, and the way they went about that was, I'm not gonna go and try out, try and get resources to, for this. I'm not gonna try and persuade people to support this. We're gonna do it on our own dime, on our own time, and uh, investing our own resources, and then we're gonna sort of see who comes. And, in every, and that may be the starkest example across the cases, but in every one of these uh, situations that we, we saw this morning, there was somebody willing to step forward. And um, we even had an invitation from um, Cindy to say, okay, look, we, if any of you are sort of uh, sitting here and having any uh, um, thoughts about how you might get involved, she's trying to stoke that and say, be one of those change agents. So let's, let's I guess, flag as one uh, theme across these initiatives today. These initiatives were not driven by a pressing market need. They were not driven by organizations that were in uh, financial stress and somehow had to fix a problem. They were driven by somebody who saw a need in the world, a social problem that they wanted to solve, and then they said, we're going to step forward and do something about that. That, I think, is, is um, inspiring to me and, and maybe one of the, the themes that I'm going to take away from the morning. C2? Yeah, thanks, Stuart. So from my standpoint, I thought, rather than summarize broad takeaways, I thought I would connect some of what we are doing here at the school to what happened in those talks. So Equifax, well, there were a couple of questions about, you know, given the data breach and so on, how wise is it to, you know, make the data open to the community? So speaking to our own partnership with Equifax, so one of our PhD students in marketing, uh, and I'm a marketing professor, by the way, is working on her dissertation using uh, Equifax data. So this data was ma made available on a secure uh, laptop, which you couldn't copy things out of and so on to, to, to make sure that uh, everything was protected. And of course, it, data was all anonymized. But she has done some very fascinating research, which she will uh, soon defend when she defends her thesis and starts as an assistant professor, where she uncovers some interesting psychological aspects of how consumers react to auto loans and how people at dealerships who are negotiating with the consumers on terms of the trade also succumb to some psychological mechanisms and how, what kind of terms of trade are finally uh, negotiated. So, so, so that's, a, that's something that we at least have, you know, partnered with them directly in terms of uh, uh, exploiting their, uh, their data. Now, MasterCard, I know I saw Dana this morning. Dana, are you still here from MasterCard? Sean, are you here? So there you are. 
So Sean Hillary is a board member uh, of the center that I run. And I know Michael said this briefly before, but uh, MasterCard is working with us in sponsoring a project for our students. So this is a practicum project where it's not so much informing their business strategy as, well, we'll make our data available. You f figure out how this is going to be of benefit to the community at large. So therefore, we are doing some interesting things with uh, our, our master's students in analytics uh, and working with MasterCard as, as we speak. And in this effort, the Doherty data set or the uh, vacancy data set could potentially be exploited as well, which is, you know, if, if there is potential blight in a neighborhood, how would that play into uh, the health of the neighborhood in some indirect ways? I mean, $17 million was shown in the morning as the direct cost of what, you know, the forestry department has to incur by way of upkeep and so on. But there are a lot of indirect costs. If there is blight, that can kind of affect the geographic neighborhoods nearby, and how do you kind of estimate that, and how do you quantify you know, the benefits gained on that front from solving blight issues? So that's something I thought I would mention. And uh, here is another way in which uh, Washington University or Olin Business School can involve itself in these community data for good projects. We have something called the Taylor Community Project, which we run out of our Center for Experiential Learning. So you can bring projects to us. It doesn't cost you a dime as long as it's seen as a nonprofit you know, community uh, project. And we'll have a group of bright bulbs work on that problem for a fo half a semester. They get academic credit for it. And in the process, we partner with you know, the likes of you who are trying to do data for good initiatives out there. So I thought I would mention that. With that, um, Maybe we can talk about uh, some of the curricular stuff that we are doing here, Stuart, which also ties yeah. into the so theme. Let, let, me, let me raise one other, one other theme that I think is, is maybe worth mentioning as we think about this morning's um, discussion. Um, and, and that is, um, what was interesting is we had this, the, I, I observed an interesting sort of dialogue between the presenters and the audience. The presenters are saying, look at all the cool things we're doing with data. And look at these data sets that we're collecting that can really be used to help solve problems. And look at how we're sort of uh, bringing these together and doing some of the uh, hewing of the logs that will enable people to then take those data and solve problems. And then we opened up for, for questions. And what I noticed is a lot of your questions were about things like, yeah, but what about privacy? And, and in collecting those data, are you perhaps discriminating against certain groups in some way that's unintended? Um, or or um, how about people's right to access and control their data? And once you've sort of built that into an algorithm and it becomes opaque to the user, what concerns does that have? And so I started to hear these, this sort of dialogue. And it's an, that should, these are the right issues, right? On one hand, we should be talking about what is the potential for data to solve these social problems. At the same time, we have to ask the questions that a lot of you were asking in your, in your remarks, which is OK, or in your questions, which was, OK, well, th that's, the, um, that's the promise. Here are the risks. Let's make sure that in doing so, so it's sort of, in, on one hand, it's the, it's the doing good. On the other hand, it's the do no harm. And uh, in, in trying to sort of do good with your data, how do we make sure that we're not doing any harm, and I think Philip pointed that out specifically, and I think called for us to have a, a session on on that issue. Anyway, so that's um, uh, those are just some observations from this morning, and some connections with what we're doing here here yeah. alone. I so. think that's a good segue to let me ask a provocative question of my colleague here. So that might okay. be a, a segue in turn into telling you some of what we are doing here in our MBA program. So Stuart, let us consider the case of. Uh, Leslie Moonves at CBS. So he was a visible business leader uh, who's supposed to have driven performance at that organization for close to two decades. And recently, we all heard about the accusations and you know his stepping down and so on, and the whole 60 Minutes story. Uh, Jeff Fager, I believe, who was running 60 Minutes for, again, a long time, he had his own. Uh, cupboard of skeletons, so to speak, opened up. So it seems like 
for close to 50 years, an enterprise or a division has been hugely successful with a lot of things going in the background, which you could claim are uh, real ethical challenges, values challenges. Now, does this mean that you know, personal values are orthogonal to doing well in business? I mean, what does one take away from you know, stories like that? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and uh, just the context, and, um, see, so I lead the, the Bauer Leadership Center, and the Bauer Leadership Center is dedicated, again, um, as Michael suggested earlier, to uh, advancing the science and practice of values-based leadership. And so I think this, this question strikes close to home that Situ is asking is, okay, so do values pay and do you need them? And can, can, you be, can you be a very successful organization without any um, kind of attending to, attending to values? And I think the, sh the short answer is, is yes, you, you, you can. I mean, I think uh, it, to, to tie it back into this conference, we're, we're, we're bringing organizations here to talk who are, have chosen to uh, invest in initiatives that, would, um, that, that, are, that are helping advance uh, the social good. Would they be okay if they didn't pursue those initiatives? I think, yeah, in most cases, it, it actually is a cost. If you think about it, um, values are an additional constraint on an organization's capacity to respond to the competitive dynamics that they're facing. And so a lot of people would ask the question, why impose that additional constraint? But now, let me give you two critical reasons why I think the answer is absolutely they should. Uh, one is, I, I think uh, organizations that uh, espouse values can carve out a very distinctive competence in the market. Think of, think of some of those organizations that we point to that have a, a clear social purpose and a mission, and, and I think we can also, in many cases, attribute their customer loyalty or their uh, employee loyalty to the social purpose and the values that they espouse. Uh, Whole Foods. We just had John Mackey from uh, Whole Foods, founder, uh, CEO, was here yesterday talking about um, conscious capitalism and how that's a key part of their initiative uh, and explains a big part of, of why people are committed. You can think of companies like um, uh, Infosys, uh, Chick-fil-A that have adopted these um, positions and those positions uh, really do carve out a distinctive position in the market. And so those, those things matter. But I think another reason is really has to do with the changing um, dynamics of what society expects of corporations. And we heard that earlier. I think it was, um, I think it was David, uh, our, our first speaker, who talked about how uh, specifically millennials are pushing Equifax increasingly to think about their social purpose. We're not just doing cybersecurity, we're solving community problems. And people want to go to work for a company that's not just doing cybersecurity, but that's also solving social problems. And so, and then he, he uh, also mentioned Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, who in a letter to um, shareholders actually came out and said, look, we're gonna, we're, we expect and society expects organizations to have a social purpose. It's no longer uh, acceptable to simply be in it for the, uh, for the financial gain without some attention to how what it is that we're doing spills over and affects um, our stakeholders and, um, and affects society. And so I, I think, uh, yeah, the, the, the short answer is yes, organizations can be successful. Uh, whether they can be successful over the long run. I mean, the, the, this CBS example is a good one because what it suggests is the society is becoming more attentive to, in this case, the Me Too movement saying, look, we're not going to put up with this anymore. And so even though they could be successful for a while, their inability to sort of, or their unwillingness perhaps, to look around, uh, around them and say, how is what we're doing um, affecting and being affected by society and, and how is it aligning with societal norms, um, that's, that, has bit them in, in, in the long run. So anyway, good. No, that's great. Uh, and the reason for raising this question is, our uh, Dean briefly mentioned it in the morning, we are uh, fairly significantly repositioning our business school in the marketplace of business schools as imparting values-driven or values-based data-driven uh, education to our students. So data-driven, at least relative to values-based, speaks for itself. We are all in the business of evidence-driven decision-making. And as researchers who teach, we try to bring our own uh, research into the classroom. 
Right? One way for a manager to make informed decisions is to kind of uncover the evidence themselves. But another, which is a time-tested way, is to lean on researchers who can encapsulate that body of data-based, evidence-based wisdom in the classroom, which they can then take as more enlightened managers. So that's a fairly big initiative going on in the school right now. And how do we communicate that? in a pretty competitive marketplace of business schools. That even though we are Washington University, it still isn't easy to, to compete uh, uh, with some other brand names, let me put it that way. Well, so let me, so let, let me ask you about that. And that, that might be a good question just as we're, as we're wrapping up here is, so I talked about the values sort of side of it. And, and what C2 and I and our partnership is trying to do is bring values and data together in our curriculum, in events like this, um, in the way that we're, in the opportunities that we provide for our students. And um, so let's, let's talk to the, to, the, to the data side a little bit. How, how, um, how well do you think students, or business schools maybe I should ask, are doing at um, really training their students to be evidence-based in their decisions rather than going with the latest fads and the latest uh, buzzwords. And, um, and then how, how can we do that better? And maybe we can point to some things that we're doing here at Olin. Yeah, I mean, when you, <clears throat> I mean, every couple of years, a new buzzword comes up. And big data was one of those buzzwords that came up a few years back. In fact, our center had big data in its uh, title, which we recently dropped saying it's become a catch-all, so we better communicate what we do uh, by not having that word in our title. Now, that said, what distinguishes, so let me talk about a program that we launched four years back, and some of that thinking is now coming into the MBA program in this sense, values-based, data-driven. So this was the customer analytics program, which has now become more broad-based and become a business analytics program with various tracks under it. So there, again, we differentiated what we set out to do from similar programs called business analytics and some other institutions by saying this program, the pedagogy of the program is uh, controlled by what we call tenured or tenure track faculty, which is people who are researchers. While in a lot of competitive programs, the pedagogy is coming mostly from so-called practitioners. I mean, not to put down, we are a professional school. We always have to high, have an eye on the ball of, hey, is all this ivory tower thinking really informing practice? But that said, some of these competitive programs are almost entirely run by practitioners, so to speak. So here, I think we have historically been uh, in the mode of delivering expensive education, which is putting our most serious researchers in the classroom. Now, that is spilling over in terms of how we market ourselves, is how I see this. So therefore, we were always evidence-based. That's not new. But uh, systematizing the thinking and the positioning of the school just disciplines all of us into making sure we pay attention to these so-called strategic pillars, as our dean would call them, in the classroom by by touching upon the fact that, hey, here is one way of running A-B tests or experiments or using your data warehouse to make better decisions. But if you don't have that luxury, at least you're left with a body of knowledge that has come from several years, maybe decades of research uh, among academics, which you can lean on as useful prior knowledge before you make those decisions in the marketplace. That's great. Right? 